Share screen. iPad. Can you guys see that squiggly up there? Yep. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> so let's get this show on the road. Um, uh, today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, phonons. We're going to continue our discussion of phonons today. And the two topics we want to discuss are uh, thermal expansion and <clears throat> thermal conductivity. For phonons. All right, that's the plan. Um, and so let's start with a discussion of uh, thermal conductivity. I'm sorry, with thermal expansion. Let's start with thermal expansion. <clears throat> and thermal expansion is actually kind of interesting. Um, it's sort of a kind of an unexpected thing in a way because it's, it's just a funny thing because if you look at a material which is just a bunch of atoms connected by springs right that's what that's what a material is so these are atoms and these are the springs um then uh If you, if you see that, then what happens is you realize that the uh, energy as a function of distance, where this is the distance between two atoms, if you look at that, then you expect it to be uh, parabolic, right? I mean, you know, because that's a spring, right? You, you change that and that, you know, it's like one half, you know, like U goes as one half, kx squared um and so then you think to yourself <clears throat> if the atoms are all jiggling <clears throat> you know like if i just consider one of the at let's just consider one atom jiggling then that atom is jiggling in this parabolic well see like that back and forth you know this is i'll call this r and so that's the jiggling atom and so you ex and so well i'll ask you this well, this is the, you know, the change in distance, delta R, and delta R equals zero right at the center. So if, um, I mean, so the atom is, is jiggling back and forth <clears throat> in this parabolic well, but what's the, what's the average position of the atom? Uh, can you tell me? Is it just the center of the well? That's exactly right. And so if it's the center of the well, and if all the atoms are doing this, you know, as you get them hotter, they jiggle more and more, but they're jiggling in this parabolic well, and the average is the center of the well. <clears throat> so, so what is the average change in the separation of atoms as I heat up a solid? Somebody tell me, what is the average change in separation of atoms as I get hotter and hotter and hotter? Tell me. Does it, does it make sense? I mean, <clears throat> the, the well is parabolic. As I go back and forth, the average position is zero. 
And so as I get the atom hotter, as I get the material hotter and hotter, the atoms go back and forth more and more and more, but the average is still zero. So what is the change in average separation of atoms as I get hotter? Tell me. Does it not change if it's still zero? That's right. That's right. It's zero. It doesn't change. And so we have just proven that there is no thermal expansion. We just, that's the proof. That proves that uh, materials don't expand as you get them hotter. But anybody, you know, who's like dealt with materials know that typically as we get a material hotter, like a chunk of copper, a chunk of iron, what happens to a, a material as we get it hotter? Does it expand in the real world? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, it's real. It definitely happens. Materials expand like a loaf of bread, you know, it gets bigger, you know, as you heat it. Um, <clears throat> and yet we just proved using our spring model that they don't expand. Uh, and so what that means is that our spring model is screwed up. It's a, it, the model is bad. So there's something about our model that's wrong. That's not taking into account the real life because in real life, as you heat materials up, they expand and as you cool them down, they shrink. That's a thing. It's a real thing. And, you know, we've all experienced that somewhere in our lives. Uh, I'm assuming. And so, um, like, I remember I used to live in Boston and I'd ride my bike, you know, late at night. It's really cold. And I remember my glasses would fall out. <laughs> Boink, the lenses would fall out, you know, because of thermal contraction of the lens because it was so goddamn cold. Um, that's one example. Um, okay, I'm sure there's many more that you could think of. All right, so why do uh, materials expand when we heat them up? And the reason <clears throat> is because our model is too simplistic and the expansion comes from what we like to call anharmonic terms. Because the idea, the, because the point is that if I have, if I have an atom and I look at the, the, the U, the energy as a function of separation, this, it doesn't look like that. It's not, that's, that's harmonic. And we know that instead, what it looks like is this. Remember this? So this is like the Leonard Jones. So the Leonard Jones does not equal a parabola. And so this is the energy of separation between uh, atoms, you know, as they move. It's, it's not harmonic. It's harmonic only at the very bottom um, of that well. You know, because the bottom of every well is always harmonic, but if so, for very small jiggles, it is harmonic, and the phonon approximation that we've made that we've used of all the simple harmonic oscillator works well. But if the but if the if if we start jiggling more, then you see as we heat things up and they jiggle more, then you can kind of see already that what's going to happen is they're going to jiggle, and they're going to you see, as I start jiggling more and more. See, as I start jiggling, <clears throat> you can see that I'm starting to lean over a little bit more to the right. You see that? And so uh, you get this mo motion to the right. And that's uh, uh, another word for that is rectification. Because we have this back and forth motion. The atoms are just oscillating, but there's a rectification going on, meaning that the average shifts them in one direction. That's, rec that's what rectification is. So there's a rectification. And so that means that there is a delta R that doesn't equal to zero uh, due to the anharmonic terms. And so it's the deviation from this perfect parabola that actually gives us a thermal expansion. And so we can, um, and so one way of, doing that then is we we can look at this um, minimum and we can say that uh, the energy <clears throat> of, of the position of the atom is now normally we would say that it's harmonic which would just be let's say c x squared let's skip the one half so that would be the harmonic term but then we see that it's as we go to the right it's a little bit less than uh, uh, than what I would get for for the harm for the uh, parabola, and so I do minus 
gx cubed. So that's the approximation. And so that's the, uh, where that's the position of atom, the deviation from equilibrium. Where I'll call this x equals zero. Okay, so that's the approximation that we make. And so then, <clears throat> um, and so then we, uh, we ask ourselves, uh, you know, how will that actually cause uh, thermal expansion? And there's a, and so there's a really simple way to see it. Then this causes thermal expansion and contraction. And there's a really nice way to see that because what we can do is let's, we can calculate the change in the atom's position, delta x, uh, as a function of temperature. And there's a really simple way to do that. Because if what we do is we, if we assume that, so here is our model for the atom. So here's the, the atom as some mass. And this is the anharmonic spring. And this is x equals zero. And so we want to know the, the deviations, delta x, as a function of temperature. And so we can see that uh, if, if the energy u of x is, we have the harmonic term and the anharmonic term, which is negative because it's a little bit lower on the right side, then uh, <clears throat> then we can calculate this. We can say that uh, the change in X is equal to um, the, what we can do is we can calculate the thermal average position, the average position of the atom as a function of temperature. And we can use a really cute little stat mech argument, which is this, we could say it's the integral over all positions of the, the position of the atom times the probability to find it at that position, dx divided by the integral uh, over all x of p of x dx, and that's the normalization term. And so basically what we're saying is, <clears throat> So this is a stat mech argument. So I hope that you all have taken stat mech. Uh, but if you haven't, then this is, this is what stat mech is. Um, and so the idea is that I have the particle is in this well, u as a function of x. And I just want to know what's the average position at a temperature t of that particle. And what we'll see is that it's going to be, this is the equilibrium, x equals zero, the very bottom of the well. And we're going to see that the, the average x is going to be shifted over a little. But to see that shift, then we have to do this integral. Uh, we have to calculate this delta x. And so to calculate this delta x, then let's do this, uh, this integral. And so it's going to be the integral. Um, from negative infinity, all, possi all possible locations of the atom, <clears throat> the x times the p of x. And uh, p of x is the probability that the atom is at a certain x. And can somebody tell me what that is going to be? Does anybody, can anybody guess? <clears throat> Using stat mech, what do you think that probability will be? Postman distribution. Exactly. P of X is going to be proportional to E to the negative U of X over KT. That is the Boltzmann distribution where the K is, is the Boltzmann constant. That's right. That's good. And so let's, so now we can do our integral and it's uh, E to the negative U of X over KT divided by the integral from negative infinity to infinity 
of e to the negative u of x over kt. And so that, that will be the delta x. So we just have to do that integral. Uh, and it turns out it's not so hard, surprisingly, to do. So let's do it. So then that's equal to uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of uh, x. Now the u of x will plug in the uh, negative c x squared. Uh, it's negative u of x and then plus g x cubed. That's just the anharmonic pl pl the harmonic plus anharmonic term. That's the energy of the atom uh, divided by kt. <clears throat> and then on the bottom, we'll just do the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative c x squared plus g x cubed over k t. And all we've got to do is these integrals. <clears throat> uh, and so what we're going to do is <clears throat> um, we will assume we'll assume that um, that the anharmonic part is small. So we'll assume that gx cubed over kt is small. Uh, and so then this, so for then this, uh, this argument, what we can do then is we can write this integral as uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of uh, e to the negative cx squared over kt times x e to the negative or e to the plus gx cubed over kt and <clears throat> and on the denominator i can just drop uh, that anharmonic part because it's so small okay uh, and so the bottom integral is just a very famous integral, the Gaussian integral. So you can look that one up in a book, just e to the negative, e to the negative something, e to the negative uh, something x squared dx. That's the Gaussian integral. It's very famous. You can look it up. And so this is equal to the bottom integral gives us kt c over pi. But that top integral, we still have to do that top integral. It's more complicated because the x is in the integral. So we got to... Um, so we take the, the big part is still exponential, but we got the x. And so then what we do is we can expand this. So here where we'll use e to the x is approximately one plus x, since gx squared is small, the anharmonic term. And so we'll do that expansion, one plus uh, g x cubed over kt. Uh, and then we do this integral, <clears throat> and we see that that this 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 term gives us an odd integral. And so you know uh, odd integrals, you know odd in space, then they go to zero. So it's an odd integral, and it goes to zero. Uh, but that uh, x cubed part gives me an even integral, uh, and so I end up with. Uh, square root of KTC over pi times the integral from negative infinity to infinity, x4 e to the negative c x squared over KT dx. Okay, so, so that's an that's, that's, that's a even integral, so it's not zero. Uh, and so then that's one that you have to look up in a book. <clears throat> but that's a famous integral. Hold on, excuse me. That's a, those Gaussian integrals are very famous. You can look them up in a book. And so when you look that up in a book and plug it in, then what you see is you get a, a, a famous answer and you, you do the algebra and you end up with three G over four C squared times K T. And so that's really cute because that tells me the position of the atom um, as a function of temperature. And you can see that the atom is gonna slip, is gonna, is gonna move to the right with temperature. So as they get hotter and hotter and hotter, it moves more and more to the right. So that's exactly the same as expansion. So that is thermal expansion.
So that's a really cute thing because the uh, the uh, the crystal uh, you need the anharmonicity to to create the thermal expansion. Without that, it would not expand. So, uh, in some sense, measuring thermal expansion is a way to measure the anharmonicity of the interaction between atoms in a solid. Um, and so then you can <clears throat> define the thermal expansion. So thermal expansion is just, uh, if I have a material, it's, it's the change in materials length uh, divided by the length uh, divided by delta T. So it, you basically take the material at T naught, this is L, and then at some other temperature, uh, T naught plus delta T, it's L plus delta L. And so from that definition, then the thermal expansion alpha is equal to this, this ratio, it's just the, the change in length per, per change in temperature. And uh, we can calculate that now because we know that if I have, <coughs> if I have, uh, if each atom moves by amount uh, delta x, and so suppose that I have, suppose that the length is n times a, where that's the unit cell size, and n is the number of unit cells. Then I would say uh, alpha is equal to something divided by L, where L is n times a divided by uh, delta t, where I just say, I'll just call that t, because we'll measure, let's suppose that t, let's suppose that t not equals zero for convention. And so uh, what's delta L? Can someone tell me? L is N times A. What's delta L? Well, you guys see the stuff I wrote on, uh, you can see it right in front of you, you know, and, and, and so I have an atom. It's like the atoms are sitting in these potential, these anharmonic wells, right? Like that, that's U, that's X. And then this is at, that's X equals zero, but then this is, I'll call that T equals zero. But then at, you say at T not equal to zero, then I see that my atom has shifted over, that's X equals zero, but now my atom has shifted over to here on average, where this distance is this delta X. And, and so- delta X T. And delta X is proportional to T. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, that's delta X T, that's right. And that's how much, so that's the expansion of every unit cell. So every unit cell has expanded by delta X. E, e, I'll make the sound, they make a little sound when they do, they go e, like that. E. And so every unit cell expands a little bit. So I'm asking you now, what is the total expansion, the total delta L of the entire material, delta L? And, and times delta, and times delta LX. Yes, very good. So that's N delta X. So I just plug, then I just plug this into this little formula here and I get alpha is equal to, <clears throat> what do I get? I get 3G over 4C squared A uh, times KB. So that's the thermal expansion coefficient that's the coefficient of thermal expansion coefficient of thermal expansion where that's uh, but then i would say but then if i wanted to plot delta l 
over L, then I see that that's equal to alpha delta T. Okay, so the delta L over L is, is proportional to temperature. And so you can actually plot it for a real material, uh, for example, silver. And if I plot uh, delta L over L as a function of temperature, then you'll see at 100 Kelvin and then at 200 Kelvin, um, you'll get, um, you'll see that, oh, I'm sorry, that was 300 Kelvin. Then we, if we push, if we make the, the reference at room temperature 300 Kelvin, uh, then the, we get a, uh, a slope like that, where you can see that that, that slope is alpha. And uh, this value here is about negative 0 0.3. Uh, but this is in percent. So it's a small, so it's, so you can see that at 100 Kelvin, a chunk of silver has shrunk by 0.3%. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a small, it's not, it's not a lot, but it's a, boy, it's enough to really mess you up if you haven't thought about it though. If you haven't taken into that, you know, if you have some machine that you want to work at low temperature, you have to design all the thermal expansions. You have to think about it because, you know, some parts are going to shrink more than others. And you got to take it all into consideration. And so engineers, mechanical engineers, have to think about this stuff all the time. But now you understand the microscopic mechanism, where it actually comes from. <clears throat> uh, it comes from the anharmonicity of the interaction between atoms. All right. So now let's talk about thermal conductivity. And so this is another thing that happens with phonons. And this is the, uh, this is heat transport. And heat is energy. So thermal conductivity is the transport of energy through a crystal. So that's what we want to talk about now. Um, and so let's just make some definitions. So suppose I have a crystal. Hey, you'll notice that that little problem I had with the little thing keep coming up. That little notice is gone. I fixed it because I, I figured out what the problem was. It was one of the ports on my computer was bad. So now I use a different port. Um, so, um, okay, so there's a definition. Suppose I have a crystal where this side is at some temperature T naught. And this side is at T naught plus delta T. So one side is a little hotter than the other. Then I'm going to get a gradient uh, dT dx. And what, what direction does, if I think of dT dx as a vector, like a gradient, you know, gradient T, what direction does that point? To the right or to the left? We got to think about the signs and directions in these conductivity arguments. So you got to kind of get used to that. So a gradient always, does a gradient point uphill or downhill? Tell me. Does the gradient of any function point where the function is getting bigger or does it point where the function is getting smaller? Tell uphill. me. That's right. Gradients point uphill. In fact, they point in the direction of maximum uphill. And that's something that you, every one of you learned in like your, you know, second year calculus or whenever the heck you took all that vector calculus. You all have learned that. You all, you all knew that at one point. So the gradient points uphill to the right. Um, and so um, that's the direction of dt dx. But what is the direction of heat flow in this material? Tell me, is it to the right or to the left? To the max. That's right, because we all know that heat flows from the hot place to the cold place. <laughs> we all know that. 
you all have learned that like you know you learn that the hard way by picking up a hot cup of coffee and burning your fingers right you go ah that damn heat you know went from the went from the coffee to my fingers and it gave me a blister okay so you've all learned you all know that uh and so <clears throat> and that's what we're talking about we're talking about the we're talking about the heat you know in a coffee cup that's what we're talking about like a ceramic mug why does this you know why does the heat go from the hot coffee in the mug to your fingers why does you know that's exactly what we're discussing right now uh okay so the the flux of energy is then to the left j and so i'll call that the energy flux energy flux and energy flux is and and i really mean it's it's really flux you know energy flux uh is um it's going to be uh energy per time oh i just sort of screwed that up let me It's going to be energy per time per per what? Flux is always something per time per what? For three dimensional flux, tell me. Area. Area. Yes, exactly. Good. You all have been. You all know about flux. I'm just you know maybe you haven't thought about it for a while, but. Uh, you can have a flux of anything, flux of water, flux of electrical current, flux of cats, you know, frogs can fall from the sky and you can have a flux of frogs. It's just going to be the stuff, water per time per area. That's the flux of water. So just remind yourself what, what flux is. Um, and so, uh, but then there's another way of thinking about flux too, um, which I just want to remind you that another way of thinking about flux is going to be um, you like if I if I think of water the flux of water it could be the water per time per area but there's another way to think of it because I could also think of the density of water I could think of the water per volume times what can you guess it's another way of thinking about flux velocity yeah exactly density times velocity so that would be the energy so the, another way of thinking about the flux of energy is the energy density in a material times the velocity of the energy as it moves in the material so these are two completely identical ways of thinking about flux just trying to remind you of that uh and you guys have thought about flux a lot like and so and so the definition of thermal conductant thermal conductivity <clears throat> is this um, what we do is is we can write uh, that j is equal to minus kappa dt dx and that is the definition of uh, thermal conductance is that the the energy flux is proportional to the temperature gradient in a material and the constant of proportionality is thermal conduct is thermal conductivity that is the thermal conductivity and so if you and so if you want to understand what is the thermal conductivity of a material then what you got to do is you got to say to yourself all right if i set up a temperature gradient then how much energy flux flows so i set up my i set up my thermal gradient my dt dx and then i got to measure the thermal the the flux of energy and i got to figure out what is the relationship between the flux of energy and the temperature gradient and that constant and that relationship will give you the thermal conductivity it's really the constant of proportionality one is proportional to the other and the negative sign is very important because the negative sign is important because it's telling you that the direction of the energy flux is opposite the gradient and temperature. So you got to remember these little negative signs. It's a pain, but it's important or else you get the wrong answer. <clears throat> All right. So and let's just remind ourselves, you know, like what's a similar definition? Um, let's talk about an analogy 
an analogy, of course, is uh, is uh, electrical current, electrical current, which is equal to J equals um, well, you guys know this, uh, J equals minus minus sigma times uh, D dx of what? Electrical current is proportional to the gradient of what? Can someone tell me? The electric field. It's, it's actually proportional to the electric field. J equals sigma E. That is Ohm's law. That's a way to write Ohm's law. That is Ohm's law. I'll just say, you know, Ohm's law, Ohm's law. But uh, what is E? E is the gradient in what? Potential. Voltage. Yeah, potential. I'll just say V, V of X, the potential. And so you know that if you have a high potential, the gradient in the potential points in the direction of the, of the potential getting higher. But the electric field points opposite that, you know, because the electric because the force on the charge is opposite that, and so the uh, electrical current is going to be is going to the the flux of of charge is going to be uh, opposite the gradient of the potential, and the constant of proportionality is conductivity. So it's the exact same thing. So that I want I just want to remind you of that. So that will help you to understand thermal conductance better. It's just, it's just a very famous thing. You know, you always have a, a flux of something is equal, is proportional to a gradient of something else, all right? It's just a very famous kind of relationship in physics. That kind of relationship comes all the time. All right, but now we're talking about energy and temperature gradient and how does energy flow? <coughs> so how do we, okay, so now let's, let's calculate. Uh, so let's try to understand the relationship between energy flux and temperature gradient uh, in a in a material where the energy and so where where J is is uh, is energy flux carried by phonons. Okay, so this is This is what we want to understand. We want to understand the phonon thermal conductivity. How much energy is carried by phonons? If I have something that's hot on one end, cold on the other, how much energy by phonons is going to go from one side to the other? <clears throat> All right. So, okay. So now we're going to solve this and we're going to figure out this relationship. But before we solve it, I just want to say <clears throat> that this is actually a very hard problem. And understanding this is called uh, transport. And understanding transport in materials is, is pretty hard, actually. You know, to really understand transport, like how does, if I put some kind of gradient, like either a temperature gradient or a voltage gradient or a magnetic field gradient, you know, all kinds of gradients that you can make, how, do the, how does stuff move in response to gradients in a material? It's very important to understand because it's very useful and important. That's how, like, devices work, electrical devices use these gradients, you know, that's how we get current, you know, and stuff to move in a, in a computer or whatever. We need to understand transport, but it's a tricky problem. It's, it's pretty complex, you know, to do it right. Uh, and the reason it's complex, I'll just tell you why, it's because it's a non-equilibrium property. And whenever you're trying to calculate non-equilibrium properties, it's always hard. Non-equilibrium means that, you know, everything's not sort of the same. It's not an equilibrium. The gradient means that you're in a non-equilibrium system. And so uh, understanding non-equilibrium properties is hard. And so we're not going to do a really in-depth treatment of this problem in this class. Uh, you know, you, you, you can see more complex, correct treatments in graduate school. Uh, they're quite tedious, you know, it's like a lot of work, you know, to, to understand it. There's all levels of complexity and trickiness and, and how you deal with this problem. But we're just going to do sort of like a simple hand waving approach. So I just want to warn you right now. <clears throat> so I just want to tell you at the onset that there are sort of more sophisticated, more correct treatments than what I'm going to show you now. 
But what I'm going to show you now is kind of like a nice way to kind of, kind of get a feel for what's going on. And it gives you the right answer, <laughs> even though the argument is like a little, uh, you know, a little uh, hand wavy. Okay, so I'm just apologizing <clears throat> in advance for using hand waving physics. <clears throat> and you can't actually put it on firmer ground, but it's just a lot of work. Okay, so let's try to do a simple treatment of this problem. So this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> <laughs> so we're going to have this picture. So we have a material. And we're going to put, we're going to say that at one end, it's T1, and at the other end is T2. And, <clears throat> and so I've got these little, let's think of these phonons as traveling through the crystal. Because remember, the phonons are the waves that are traveling through the crystal these waves, like these uh, strain waves, you know, that we discussed, like these waves of distortion traveling through the crystal. So, uh, and these waves carry energy. Um, and so these are the phonons and it's, it's, it's the, everything's kind of random <clears throat> because it's, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have all this thermal energy and it's random energy, but one side is a little hotter than the other side. So it's a little tricky. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider what happens in this one area in the center. <clears throat> we're gonna consider these, these phonons are, are going in every direction, but let's just consider one of them and let's ask ourselves, uh, let's consider a length, which is, which is what we call the mean free path. <clears throat> and so this length is Lx equals the mean free path in the x direction. So I'll call it, so MFP equals the mean free path. And that's the distance that the phonon goes before scattering equals the distance between scattering events. And it's a very important concept. Because when you're talking about <coughs> how stuff <coughs> moves in a crystal, whether it's electrons or phonons or anything, the way that things move is going to be completely determined by scattering. What, how far can the thing move before it bounces off of something? Scattering. So, all right. So it's the scattering that, that determines how easy or, or hard it is for stuff to move through a crystal. So, and the scattering is described by this concept of mean free path, the distance you go before you bounce off of something, before you hit something. So it's a very kind of straightforward concept, but calculating it can sometimes be very complex, but the concept itself is very straightforward concept, just the distance you travel before scattering. <clears throat> okay, so now this is, a, we're talking about three-dimensional crystals, but it's a funny thing because even though we're talking about a three-dimensional crystal, the problem always reduces to a one-dimensional problem because the temperature gradient is always a one-dimensional object. Like there's always a temperature, the temperature gradient is just in one direction, you know, like I got the hot side and the cold side, and then I got, I can just draw an arrow from hot to cold. Now, of course, you could have a more complex situation where I could actually have, you know, some object where it's like, you know, hot and cold and, you know, all kinds of weird uh, you know, temperature gradients all over it. But, but for our purposes, let's just consider uh, one side is hot and one side is cold. And so even though it's a three-dimensional system, it reduces to a one-dimensional problem because heat will flow from the hot side to the cold side. I'm sorry, yeah, from the hot side to the cold side. Okay, and that's why <clears throat> we just do this as a one-dimensional problem. Okay, so, um, all right. Now, okay, so now... <clears throat> So now we have to ask ourselves, if I have a phonon, then how much heat is it going to take from 
the hot side to the cold side? Like how, what is the transport of heat? And so I want you to think of, <clears throat> so I want you to think of the, this is like a phonon. So what we want to think about now is a phonon mode. Now we know what a phonon mode is. It's it's the uh, it's the wave. It's that traveling wave, right? You know, it's you know the wave e to the i k x. That's the phonon mode for a particular k. Every mode, every different k is a different mode. <clears throat> you remember because we had these <clears throat> omega versus k, and we did this. And we had all our acoustic modes, right? And these are the modes. I'm drawing them, little dots, omega versus k. I didn't draw it well, but I hopefully you'll remember uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, so, one. <clears throat> so, remember how I said that each mode is like a simple harmonic oscillator, right? With all those levels, every mode is like a simple harmonic oscillator. And so what I want you to think now is that each mode is like a little cart. This is how I like to think of it, like a little, that those are wheels. This is a cart, a little cart that carries energy. And how much energy is that little cart carrying? Well, that's pretty easy to figure out because the little card is like a little simple harmonic oscillator. You know, like I'm drawing like the potent, the parabolic potential of a simple harmonic oscillator. And there's all these levels. It's a ladder. And I know that the spacing between the levels is H bar omega of K. And I know that that little phonon mode is carrying some energy. And that energy is wherever the little ball is. Beep, but there's the little ball. And the little ball is sitting at some level, which is N. And so the energy in the little cart, energy per mode, is going to be equal to N times H bar omega. Right? And so uh, because where N is the, bolts, is the bose einstein distribution function, we calculated that. So that mode is carrying that much energy that's the way to think about it so the mode you know is a little cart that carries that much energy <clears throat> um, and so uh, um, so what we do then is we can say that <clears throat> um, so we have these little carts uh, these little modes on the right and on the left and so what's happening is on the right the little carts are going to be carrying more more uh, energy because because here n of t2 let, let me write it here so well I'll just write like this is big but here n of t1 is small so you see that the carts on the right side have more energy than the carts on the left side. And so what's going to happen is that the way that the energy is going to flow is that the carts on the right are going to take energy from the right and they're going to dump it into the, into the left side. So the, a cart on the right takes its energy and then gives it up. It like it says, here's my energy, Ugh, and it gives it. To, it's going to move from the right to the left and it dumps its energy. Um, and how does that actually happen? Well, the way it happens is via the scattering events. So like the phonon is coming along and the way to think about it intuitively, at least, or qualitatively, is the phonon comes along and it uh, scatters with another phonon and then it gives up its extra energy because the idea is that the scattering causes thermal equilibrium.
because thermal equilibrium occurs like if if I have a bunch of phonons and they all have like a normal Boltzmann distribution of energy, but then I get some phonon that has like too much energy. What he's going to do is he's going to come in and just scatter with those other phonons, and he's just going to give up his energy to those guys, and he's going to equilibrate. That's the process of equilibration. Uh, equi equilibration. Equilibration is that the hot one's going to come. And just give up its energy and then equil equilibrate. <clears throat> but the same thing happens in the reverse direction. I have cold phonons from the left are going to move to the right and they're going to suck energy out of the hot side on the right. So I got hot ones going to the left and I got cold ones going to the right. And so I got energy sort of, uh, so the energy is going to be flowing from right to left, but there's going to be sort of two components. I'm going to have the hot ones that are going to carry energy. But then I'm also going to have the cold ones are going to come. And they're going to suck energy up. All right. So, so now we have to ask ourselves, how much of that energy is it? So what we got to do is we have to calculate. We have to calculate uh, J, X, the energy flux. And so J, X is going to be... Uh, <clears throat> Jx is going to be the uh, density of phonon modes uh, is, which is the number it's going to be the actually let me I don't think I want to write all that I'm gonna I'm just gonna say it's going to be the uh, the number of uh, phonon modes per volume. Then I have to ask myself the average energy gain or loss uh, per phonon mode uh, and then per phonon mode for a scattering event And then V is the uh, velocity, the average velocity. <clears throat> so it's sort of like I have these little carts filled with energy. They're zooming along and then they scatter and then they dump out their energy. But they dump out the extra energy that they have because in order to keep things at thermal, uh, th uh, in order to keep things thermalized, they just don't, all they do is they dump out the extra energy because we think of, we're thinking of the crystal as it, that it's in thermal equilibrium at every point in space. So that's like an approximation, but we just say that uh, we're in, we're in thermal equilibrium at every point in space. <clears throat> okay. So now let's plug in what, what those things are. Uh, and we see that the density of phonon modes <clears throat> is basically we basically have, we have to consider, let's consider the, the phonon modes in, in one direction going from right to left. And then what we see is that we have half of N because we know that the, we know that the number, the total number of phonon modes is equal to the total number of atoms. Remember we did that in class. And so, and so the total density of phonon modes is N, the total density of atoms. And so if we're talking about from right to left, half of them are moving from right to left. And all right, so right to left. So that's the number of modes per volume. And then the energy loss per scattering event. Now this is actually, this part is, is actually kind of tricky because it's gonna be, <clears throat> The, the change in energy, we know that delta U over delta T is equal to what? Can you tell me what's delta U over delta T? Heat capacity. Exactly. <coughs> so if a phonon mode has a little extra energy compared to the other phonon modes, delta U, then that's going to be C delta T. And so that's going to be the extra energy, extra energy per mode. 
And so that's going to be the heat capacity, heat capacity per mode. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the heat capacity for a phonon mode? And then, then that's how much energy that phonon mode has to drop off as it moves from the hot area to the cold area. So right here, it's going to be uh, C delta T. And so, and what we're talking about here is this, is that here I got T naught, and here I have, I'm, I'm drawing now in my, uh, on my drawing, this is T naught plus delta T. And so now let's just consider the temperature gradient is, is over the distance of the mean free path. All right, so we're thinking, so we're asking ourselves, what's the temperature gradient over the mean free path distance? And so that's the, that's delta T over distance LX equals the mean free path. Because, and, and it's gonna, it's negative because it's gonna dump the energy to oppose the temperature gradient. It's because it wants to make, it wants to make the cold part, it wants to make the hot part cold, it wants to make the cold part hot. Um, and then the velocity <clears throat> is just going to be this velocity, the x, the x direction velocity. But then I have to multiply by a factor of two because it works over both directions. That last factor of two is because I got the cold ones coming in and they're sucking up energy. And then I got the hot ones. The cold ones are coming from left to right, sucking up energy. The hot ones are coming from right to left, dumping out the energy. But both of these processes cause energy to flow to the left. <clears throat> so that is my thermal flux. So I, I, I think that's kind of a confusing thing. You know, You have to think about it for a while. But uh, but once you uh, under, once you take that as a given, then calculating the thermal conductance becomes very easy. <clears throat> so that was the hardest part is just trying to understand that picture is the hard part. But once but the formulas and the equations are just totally simple. So let's just do the formulas really fast because now we can see that the math is easy. It's the picture that's co that's complex and hard. I think so. The the thermal the flux of energy then is minus n the the density um uh the phonon density n <clears throat> um the den this is the density of phonons and then c c is going to be the uh the heat capacity heat capacity per phonon and then i have uh uh vx and i have the delta t and that and that delta t is the is the is and delta t is the temperature gradient over the distance of, of the mean free path of the phonon. So uh, now we can write this out as uh, minus N times C uh, Vx. Now delta T, I can write the delta T, the temperature gradient, uh, the, the, the change, in te change in temperature is just gonna be the temperature gradient dt dx times a distance. What distance do I put here? Right here, what distance do I put there? Mean free path. Yes, the mean free path, exactly. Thank you. LX. Uh, and so now we just can uh, play a little game and then I, I can do this. I can say that this is minus N C V X D T dx but now i could call this vx tau 
and I can and I can call this a scattering time. Lx equals vx tau, where tau is the scattering time equals the time between scattering events between scattering events. Okay. And so then this V will go here. And so this is equal to minus N C V X squared D T D X times tau. All right. <clears throat> um, and so now we have to do like a little bit of thermal averaging. So there's just a little bit of uh, arguments to, to get the thermal averaging correctly, correct? <laughs> so what we'll do is <clears throat> we'll have to say, first, let's say that N times C is equal to big C, which is just the, the heat capacity per volume, which is what we calculated last lecture. So, because if I take the, the density of phonons times the heat capacity per phonons, uh, then that's just the total heat capacity of the material. Um, and so then this is, which we call the specific heat. The heat capacity per volume is the specific heat. Um, and so then <clears throat> we have, um, that the thermal flux is equal to, but now we can ask ourselves, but now we ask ourselves, what's the, the average value? Because it's, we wanna do a thermal average. And so we can say, well, the average, we can take the average of both sides. And we say that this is gonna be equal to uh, minus C, the, heat, the specific heat times the average uh, X squared, velocity of the of the phonons and i still have this gradient dt dx uh, times tau uh, and so now i'm going to use a little trick the, my little trick is that if i have a gas of of particles If I have a gas of particles, then I know that the um, the average x squared velocity is equal to the average y squared velocity is equal to the average z squared velocity. And I know that one half m, the kinetic energy is equal to one half m, the average the RMS, we call it the root mean square velocity, is going to be one half m time, time oops, forgot the m, is going to be one half m uh, v x squared plus v y squared plus, oops, plus v z squared. Right? So that's just like a little uh, sort of thermodynamic stat mech argument. And so what that means then is that as a result, the, the, the bottom line is that Vx squared is equal to uh, some fraction times the total velocity <coughs> of the phonons. What fraction? What fraction goes there? Where well, I just drew the little arrow. One third. Exactly. That's exactly right. And so uh, that's where I get this weird little factor of one third. And so I get minus C times one third um, VRMS uh, VTDX tau. Uh, and so now I can 
now I can uh, take away that average sign. So it's, and I can say uh, minus one third heat capacity. Now this is the RMS velocity times dt dx times v rms tau and this i'll just call the uh l is equal to the mean free path <coughs> and so that was actually a lot of gobbledygook uh to get this simple result minus one third c uh v rms times L times dt dx. Where this is, so, and uh, I just did a bunch of work because <clears throat> what I did was I turned, before I did the derivation in terms of LX, the X component of the mean free path, because I was talking about that one direction, but now I've turned it into L, the total mean free path, L. This is a total mean free path by doing this little trick with the one third. Okay, so then we have it. So we have our result. So remember I said the definition of thermal conductivity, the definition is that I have, uh, the definition of thermal conductivity is that J equals minus kappa dt dx and i just derived this thing above and so that tells me then that k is equal to what tell me three one over three c v l exactly and so that's like the fam a very famous formula thermal conductivity is equal to one third times heat capacity times the velocity of the phonons times the mean free path. So that's specific heat. That's velocity of phonons. And that's the mean free path. <clears throat> now, uh, so, so now let's ask ourselves what's Temperature dependence. Okay, how does the thermal conductance of a material change as a function of temperature? Uh, and so <clears throat> to do that, there's a trick. Um, there's gonna be there's gonna be three regimes. Um, And the three regimes are going to be, there's going to be uh, the hot regime where I'm going to have T much bigger than the Debye temperature, or I can have T uh, sort of on the order of the Debye temperature, <clears throat> or I can have T um, much less than the, than the Debye temperature. And so um, it turns out that um, the question then is, what is the, I have this product C times V times L, and how does it, how does it, what's the, we want to know what's the temperature dependence of this product. Of that product, and I'll put the little one third there. Okay, and so let's, let's consider this one uh, um, temperature range, let's consider the first one is the hardest, the temperature on the order of the Debye temperature. And so, um, okay, so, <clears throat> so what's going to happen is you're going to have, it's, you're going to have phonon collisions. Remember, it's the phonon collisions. We, we want to ask ourselves, what's L? We want to know what's the temp we want to ask ourselves what's the temperature dependence of the mean free path 
in this in this uh, temperature range. And it's a little bit tricky because <clears throat> you want to ask yourselves, what are the scattering events that cause thermal equilibrium? In other words, you remember how I told you, like I have a phonon mode, which is dumping its energy. You know, it comes along, it scatters and dumps its energy. Well, what are the scattering events that causes an actual energy change in, in the phonons, you know, as a phonon is coming along? And, and here's the tricky thing, which is that if I have two phonons moving in the same direction, um, for example, if I have a phonon here, which is, if this is K, um, and this is the first Brillouin zone, pi over A minus pi over A, then if this phonon is K1, and this phonon is K2, <clears throat> and if I had, if I had uh, K1 plus K2, equals K3, if that's a scattering event, meaning that these two phonons scatter to say another phonon, then if it's all, if it's all in the Brillouin zone, then there's no change, no change in energy. If all in the first Brillouin zone, then no change in energy. And so then no, uh, no equilibration. So this, this is not important for thermal equilibration, equilibration. Meaning that, that these scattering events that occur in the first Brillouin zone don't cause equi uh, equilibrium to occur. They don't help me to establish thermal equilibrium. Because it's basically just saying if I have two phonons with a certain amount of energy and they scatter, then all the energy that they had goes into the other phonon. Because if the if the momentum, is, <clears throat> because if I have the Debye model where omega is proportional to k, then if I have two guys uh, scattering into a third guy, then all of their energy goes into the third guy, and it's the same amount of energy moving along. The scattering event has not changed the energy, so that is not an event where the little uh, pot of energy dumps out some of its energy. So to actually, so the kinds of scattering events that we're talking about, that we care about for thermal, that really cause, uh, that really uh, determine the thermal conductance are the umklop scattering. So it's only the umklop scatterings that matter. Because now I have pi over A, minus pi over a and so i have uh so what happens is now if i have k1 k2 then this is going to be my k3 but i poked out of the brillouin zone and so I can go back by G. I have to fold myself back by G, where G equals 2 pi over A. And so now this is my K3. So now K1 plus K2 equals K3. It reverses direction. So you see that? So that it's the umklop, the umklop scattering reverses direction. And that's what causes thermal equilibrium. So it's these big phonons that matter. I need the big ones to, to cause thermal equilibrium. The little ones don't do it. It's the big ones. I need the big ones to sort of, uh, those are the ones that are going to cause this reversal. 
And so this, <clears throat> the, and, and a nice way to think about it is, is it's sort of the, uh, I can think of like thermal resistance because if you have thermal conductance then thermal resist, you also have thermal resistance. So thermal resistance is one over K. And so a nice way to think about it is that these are the phonons that cause thermal resistance because as heat is moving, but then it, it scatters. And so this is sort of impeding the flow of heat uh, is the, are these events. And so those are the important ones. So these are the ones that determine the L that we care about. <clears throat> we care about the umklops. And so the question then is, is how much uh, of those umklops do we have? And so um, <clears throat> for the Dubai model, then you guys remember that we have omega versus K. Um, and so then we see that I have my K to buy. And so you can see that the that if I think of K to buy sort of on the order of pi over A, the Brillouin zone edge, it's not exactly equal to it, but it's pretty close. So this is just hand waving. And so what we need then is we need K1 and K2 to be on the order of one half K to buy which is on the order of one half <clears throat> um, pi over A. Because the, K, the, the, the Dubai uh, wave vector is the highest wave vector, which is sort of on the, is kind of close to the brilliant zone boundary. And so that's what we, that's what we need to get the umklop scattering. Uh, and so then what we do is we say um, that the uh, number then the, the density of phonons with k equals one half k to buy is simply going to be equal to n, the, um, it's the, 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 uh, uh, the Bose-Einstein distribution function. It just tells me the number, like how many phonons. It's like how many phonons are in that mode. So the what what is the, how much is that mode excited? So the number of phonons is going to be just the Bose-Einstein distribution function, which is uh, <clears throat> or the density of those phonons is going to be proportional to the Bose-Einstein distribution function. So this is the the density of phonons that have that k is gonna be proportional to one over E to the energy minus one. And what's the energy? If I have a phonon that has a wave vector half the Debye wavelength, what is the energy of that phonon? Because I, because it's E to the energy over KT. What's the energy that goes in the top of that exponent? Do you guys know? What's the energy of a phonon that has half the Debye? Look, this is the Debye wave vector corresponds to the Debye frequency and half is here. One half K Debye. And so this frequency, so what's this frequency right there? Can you guess? Can anyone guess? H bar omega d over two? Yeah, exactly. It's gonna be half the divide frequency. That's right. So one half h bar omega divide. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and so that, so then, um, so then if I, um, if, if I increase temperature, so if I increase for increasing T, then um, H bar omega Dubai 
<clears throat> over KT. Wait, let me get this right. So I'm going to have one. Well, let's let's actually not talk about increasing for not increasing temperature, but if if I if I'm talking about lower temperature, then if I think of h bar to by over kt is is greater than one, then just to get a then we can write that um, uh, one over h bar omega to by over kt minus one is approximately equal to one over e to the one half h bar omega to by over kt, which equals e to the minus one half h bar omega to by over kt. <clears throat> and so then we see that the, the density of phonons uh, at the one half k to by wave vector is proportional to um, e to the minus theta to by over two t. So that's sort of like the famous relationship that we get because uh, theta to by over two is equal to one half h bar omega to by um, divided by divided by k. Okay, and so then that's going to be, and so then <clears throat> we see that um, the mean free path is always going to be proportional to one over the density, because if if I if the density of phonons increases, then the distance between them shrinks, and so the the mean free path goes as one over the density because. The, the mean free path is essentially just the distance between the phonons because then they'll hit each other. Um, they'll bump into each other. And so the, the mean free path is one over the density of phonons. <clears throat> and so then we see that the mean free path is proportional to e to the plus theta to by over 2t. And so that then is the dominant so for the intermediate regime, for the intermediate temperature regime, then I see that the because I have I have K equals one third C V L, and this is exponential. And so and so the dominant term is always the exponential term. <clears throat> and so we see then that the thermal conductance in this intermediate regime, K, versus uh, temperature is going to be, is going to go as, uh, is going to be exponential. It's going to be E to the theta to by over 2T. And then the and then the question becomes what happens in the high temperature regime, and what happens in the low temperature regime, and so that's what we'll we'll talk about next time. Okay, folks, this is a good a good place to stop. So, I'll see you later. Bye bye. See you. See you. See you.